Hi, I'm Julie Cooper, half of the Kendall and Cooper duo, and I'm a writer of mysteries and thrillers with mostly military settings. I've just completed the third in a series, and I'm also a longtime reader of mysteries of all kinds, so we'll have lots to share with you. First, I wanted to give credit for our wonderful intro music to my brother, Chris Squires, for his original composition called The Man in the Panama Hat. Hi, I'm Wendy Kendall of Kendall and Cooper Talking Mysteries, and I lean towards the cozy end of the spectrum. But Julie and I meet across the broad genre of mysteries because we love all of them. You know, mysteries entice and transport readers by presenting interesting locales as well as professions. So research is important to the story. Mystery readers and viewers are eager to devour clues and to learn about people, professions, and locations that they don't know. And then they want to use that knowledge to piece together solutions, either by logical deduction, fast action, or instinct. And I'm pleased that we have a very special guest today, and she knows a lot about bringing locations to life in several media. Our guest is Erin Byrne, and she's author of Wings, Gifts of Art, Life, and Travel in France. She's winner of the Paris Book Festival Award for the Travel Genre. She's editor of Vignettes and Postcards from Paris and Vignettes and Postcards from Morocco. And also, she's the writer of the Storykeeper documentary film. Erin's travel essays, poetry, fiction, and screenplays have won numerous awards, including three Grand Prize Solas Awards for Travel Story of the Year, the Reader's Favorite Award, Forward Review's Book of the Year finalist, and an Accolade Award for Film. Erin is an occasional guest instructor at Shakespeare and Company Bookstore in Paris, one of my favorite places on earth, and also teaches on deep travel trips. Her screenplay, Siesta, is in pre-production in Spain now, and she is working on the novel, The Red Notebook. You can find her website by going to www.e-burn, that's spelled B-Y-R-N-E, dot com. Welcome, Erin. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Julie and Wendy. I'm so excited to talk about mystery today because all my work attempts to go toward the mysteries of connection between ourselves and the places to which we travel. It's all about what haunts us. And in my writing, I try to evoke the unexplainable, not to explain it, but to evoke it. Uh, Wings is my collection of travel essays. Uh, It's woven into a kind of memoir And it's a book about how I traveled around France with the ghosts of artists and other historical figures who shared with me their guides to living. Essentially, each essay evokes a mystery of life, art, or travel. And when I'm thinking about the way I write, I do actually write as if I'm writing a mystery because I embed clues and then pull them all together at the end. Vignettes and Postcards is this anthology series I edit that celebrates the hidden clues in each culture. And so each of the writers in these anthologies went deep in the way that I go deep in my writing uh, to uncover meaning and connections, and the results are really powerful. And hopefully that's the reason most of us travel, is to discover things that we didn't know before. But I do have a couple questions for you. For the Vignettes and Postcards series, how did you choose the locales you did? Well, when I think about it, uh, the locales sort of choose me. I had started going to Paris a lot because I just felt this uncanny fit there. And I was teaching kind of a longer workshop at Shakespeare and Company, So I put together a collection of writings from that workshop and then um, the publishing company Reputation Books, which is run by my agent, Kimberly Cameron, said, you know, why don't we do a new edition of that? And so we did and we added uh, two poems by Billy Collins and stories by Don George of Lonely Planet and National Geographic uh, Traveler and Georgia Hess, 
who we call the grand dame of travel writing here in the Bay Area. And um, so Morocco, I w- went there to teach a workshop. I had traveled there a couple times. And actually, my falling in love with Morocco was quite tumultuous. Uh, the culture is, it's like stepping back into the into another time uh, when you're there. And and it took me a long time to kind of fall in love with Morocco because it flattened me at first. And I write about that in the introduction to the, uh, the Morocco book. But I also went there last year and taught a workshop with the master storyteller of Marrakesh, uh, Ahmad Azhar Ghani, called Hajj. And so I also kind of fit him in there as a postscript to the book. Uh, the books are rich in images and photos to evoke place. And uh, the next vignettes and postcards is probably going to be about Spain. Um, and I'm really drawn to Spain because of this concept of Duende. Uh, Federico Garcia Lorca, the poet, um, kind of evoked this concept, which is the dark force, kind of the black thread. And he 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 injected it into his writing in this way that I've always been really fascinated with. Uh, there's a piece in the Wings book called Duende in the Louvre that kind of delves into that concept a little more. Sounds fascinating. And speaking of Morocco, for your Morocco book, why did you choose the specific authors that you did? Well, I had originally taught at this uh, deep travel workshop, which was run by Christina Ammon and Anna Elkins. And so I had some of the writers from that workshop, including Christina and Anna. Uh, There are sketches by Anna and also poems. Uh, She's also the sketch artist for my Wings book. But uh, Susanna Clark, who wrote the book A House in Fez, is part of our workshop. And so she has a story in the Morocco book about the children's library in the Medina. Uh, Sandy McCutcheon is her husband who writes political thrillers. And he has uh, two awesome little pieces in it. The photographer we work with there, Omar Shanafi, has photos and the cover photo. Uh, Siddharth Gupta is an Indian guy who is in the workshop and he's he's a fantastic photographer. So I have a lot of his photos. Uh, Kimberly Lovato is a really awesome travel writer who is along on that trip. So then I had those writers and then I also started asking friends of mine Uh, Jeff Greenwald, I knew that he had a chapter in his book, The Size of the World, in which he travels around the world without leaving the ground. Uh, I knew he had a chapter about Morocco, and I knew that he had sat down for a very long conversation with Paul Bowles. So there are three three pieces by him in the book. Uh, Phil Cousineau's story is a little tiny prose story called The Marrakesh Way from his Book of Roads is really one of my favorite pieces of writing ever. So I asked him if I could have that. Uh, I remembered that Rolf Potts had (laughs) gone on this crazy journey where he traveled all over the world without baggage, and he had this vest that he just crammed all his stuff in his vest. That I'd like to see. I'd like to see that. You can find it online if you just Google like Rolf Potts' um, journey without baggage. But... Anyway, I remembered that he had been in Chef Shawin and had a story about that. And then um, our friend Marcia De Sanctis had mentioned to me that she had a story. Her dad was physician to the king, and she had this story about her parents going there that she'd always wanted to write. And so she wrote it's just a fantastic story called Time or the Sahara Wind. And um, it's also included in the Best Travel Writing Anthology, and it just won a Lowell Thomas Award. So then I I had this Paul Bowles piece that I'm going to read an excerpt from soon that I really, really wanted. So I contacted his estate to see if I could use that. And then Michael Chabon had a story in Bon Appetit about his family kind of tootling around Morocco, and they stopped for this this just unforgettable lunch. So I asked him if, and he contributed it. So um, I kind of pieced it together that way. Fabulous. It sounds like an all-star cast. And Morocco certainly, I think, is a place that fascinates many of us. 
Uh, one more Morocco question. In in that book, you tease tales of quests and mysteries. Can you share with us a little bit of a mystery to whet our appetite? Well, there's probably a mystery in every single story in the book. Uh, Sandy McCutcheon, uh, there's an excerpt of one of his novels that evokes a female gin. Uh, MJ Pramick wrote this lovely, lovely little story about Baraka, which is sort of the spiritual wind, the spiritual feeling there. Uh, there's another piece by Phil Cousineau called The Blind Guides of the Sahara. And then this excerpt of Paul Bowles' work that I'd like to read a little piece of, where he sets you in the Sahara at night. You leave the gate of the fort or town behind, pass the camels lying outside, go up into the dunes or out onto the hard stony plain and stand a while alone. Presently, you will either shiver and hurry back inside the walls or you will go on standing there and let something very peculiar happen to you something that everyone who lives there has undergone and what the French call le baptême de solitude. It is a unique sensation and has nothing to do with loneliness, for loneliness presupposes memory. Here in this holy mineral landscape, lighted by stars like flares, even memory disappears. Nothing is left but your own breathing and the sound of your heart beating. And I really hope that your readers will find this book and read the rest of this excerpt. It's so beautiful. It is beautiful. Um, I, I do evoke quests and mysteries in all my work, in my film and teaching as well. The Storykeeper film is about a young boy in occupied Paris who was haunted by the crash of a U.S. Air Force B-17 in his neighborhood. And he spent years piecing together the stories of the crew members and ultimately offered them healing and, and in a way kind of healed his own, his own wounds from the occupation there were three dead men in the plane and he knew that there were the crew was 10 men so um the film is this story about how he pieced these mysteries together and he has won the medal for veterans of foreign wars uh, by the u.s but no one had ever told his story so that film actually, um, my filmmaker is a Dutch filmmaker, Roger v Van Beek Kalkuin, and he has put the film up uh, during the duration of kind of my Wings initial launch. So it's on YouTube. You can find it if you if you go to YouTube and search for Aaron Byrne Wings, and you can also find out more info by going to thestorykeeperthefilm.com. But we did a um, a really successful festival run in 2013 with it. Uh, and my teaching in Paris and on deep travel trips is this process of writing uh, in which writers go deep to uncover connections and get to the heart of their stories. And it's kind of like uh, an investigation. And it all starts with the questions. And so uh, questions can lead to quests. And uh, there's a story, Deep Travel Notre Dame, in the Wings book that really explains this. And when I teach, I start with I start with the writers. We start with an image or scene from one of their travels, and we just start asking questions. And these connections basically just light up like a power grid. Uh, I'm starting a newsletter in which I will be offering uh, these kinds of questions to my readers and I'm in a, I'm working right now on a blog about that very, you know, sort of offering this process to everybody because I, I think that everybody has these mysteries from their travels that they can get at, whether they're writing about them or just experiencing them. Terrific. 
Yeah, that sounds really great. I will definitely be one of the people subscribing to your newsletter. <laughs> I will. I will, too. Awesome. And I have one more question for you here. Um, is there a formula or specific steps, Erin, that you use when you research a new location or a culture? Or is each place sort of a serendipitous exploration or completely unique research experience? Well, I mean, you have to have, as my, as my writers will know, you always have to have the focus of what you're writing about very clear in your mind. Now, as you sort of follow your fascination when you're in a place, that focus can change. So it's kind of a fluid focus at first. Okay. So I follow my fascination. The story finds me. I take tons of notes by hand. I ask, ask, ask. I basically am very, very attuned to my curiosity, and that's where I go. I listen, and I try to observe, like, the hidden story, what's underneath, the undercurrents. And after doing this for, I've been writing for eight years, like, I, my intuition is, is sort of fine-tuned for this. So okay. um, I feel like, I feel like I've almost, and I felt like this about the writers of my anthologies, too. Like, we're divining rods for meaning. So that's what we're looking for. And then as the focus becomes clear, and this is how it's kind of like a mystery, uh, the answers appear in this really strange kind of mystical process where we start making these connections and then clues and hints and direct and other directions um, just kind of appear in our lives. Almost like the law of attraction where you yeah. start getting curious or interested in something and then suddenly things appear. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm currently working on a novel called The Red Notebook, uh, a novel of resistance, resistance in occupied Paris. And in the Storykeeper film, you'll see this character, Jeanette Roche, and I write about this in this uh, Storykeeper story, actually, that's in the book in the Wings book, but uh, she's just a character who helped one of these Americans who was who ended up in the Parisian Resistance. And I realized that that's kind of a group of unsung heroes, people, Parisians who were there, who hid Americans. And so my novel is about um, people in the Resistance who hid American spies. And in the novel, there's a plot to kill Goring, at the Ritz, Paris, and uh, when I was there in June, I did a lot of research and I got to do like a tour of the newly remodeled Ritz and see the suite, I was in the Coco Chanel suite and I got to see the suite where Goring stayed. Um, yeah, so that, that's where I'm going next. That sounds like great fun. And I have another question for you specific to locales. When does a setting in your books or books that you found that you dearly love, when does the setting become more than a backdrop where it transforms into actually another character? And do you have an example of this for our listeners in, in some of your recent writing? Uh, yes. Actually, in my book, there's all these stories in which the place becomes a character. Uh, Bordeaux, saint Millon, which is a little village in Bordeaux, um, I'm the grape, and it acts on me to change me and sort of draw me out. There's a story called Wise Beams in Wings, where a set of 17th century ceiling beams starts, they start telling me stories about the histories in, in France. Normandy is featured in quite a lot of the stories in Wings, and it's, it's definitely a place that is just alive with ghosts. Um, Arl and X, I, I, I feel the presences of these people who are in these places so much in those places. Um, a book that I've read recently is Celtic Twilight by William Butler Yeats. Basically, it's the stories, but he went around the west of Ireland collecting people's stories of the supernatural. So there are all these stories of spirits and fairies and, um, 
And I'm going to talk a little bit more about Ireland, how the landscape and the people are very woven together. But Celtic Twilight is just it's so awesome. It's just a little tiny book of those accounts. Sounds I'm, wonderful. Yeah. I'm also working on a film called Siesta. It's a short film that Roger Roger uh, Van Beek Cajuin and I are doing in Spain. And this is a story in which Spain is actually a character, an agent of change for one American man named Timothy Peels. And in the village, in Spanish villages, like, so it has all these characters that are quintessentially found in Spanish villages, like a group of old men, there's an old flamenco dancer, there's even a bull, and all these characters present different aspects of Spanish culture. And uh, again, the concept of duende is found is found throughout this little film. Erin, do you feel that landscapes, environments shape people, or that the impact is stronger vice versa? And, and how does this influence change in the current day where people have easier access to travel and education about places all over the world? Well, I actually do feel that it's both. Uh, the last trip I went to is to Ireland and I just, I just wrote a story about that called Into Celtic Twilight, which is basically about me in Ireland and Ireland in me. Uh, the first time I went there, I just had the strangest sensation that I had grown up there. So I wrote a story about that called Spirals. Um, it won the Silver Award for Travel Story of the Year, and it's included in the Best Travel Writing Anthology. I think it's, um, I think it was 2011. It's in that. But um, in Ireland, the people and the landscape are their their spiritual beliefs and their their culture is just so interwoven with the landscape and the history that it it kind of it kind of is the perfect example of this. But I really think you know this current day when people have they have we have easier access to all this information, but. When we travel, do we fully experience a place? I have a very, very strong feeling that unless we entirely unplug, we can't let a place beguile us. So if you are looking through a lens or posing for a selfie or giving real-time reports about your reaction to a place on like Twitter or Facebook or something, then I just don't think you're giving yourself enough chance to process the place. I mean, you can see when you read the Morocco book, especially the introduction, like if I would have instantly, the first time I went there, if I would have been like, you know, solidifying my views of Morocco, I never would have moved past my initial reaction. So I think, um, I think I just advocate unplugging in as much as you possibly can when you travel so that you can direct your attention outward. Wow, that's a really good point. Yeah, that full immersion in, into the experience. That, that's really interesting. That's really insightful. I want to pull you back a little bit uh, closer to home for me because I, I live in Washington State, so I'm particularly interested and intrigued with the concept of relating the Palouse here in Washington State to France in your work Bastille Day on the Palouse. What started that idea and and how do you weave in the historical figures to the landscapes? Well, <laughs> actually, I'm from the Seattle area. So I had returned home after a month in France and I felt like this pastel puzzle piece dropped onto this wrong puzzle. I was sitting in this <laughs> strip mall where there were like, you know, advertisements for teriyaki cigars, uh, airbrush designs for my nails. And I was just pining. <laughs> and so it was bestie day and I was driving my son um, across the state to Pullman for orientation 
And I was determined to do this drive just thinking about France the whole way because it was Bastille Day. So, um, but what happened was I started driving and I was driving over um, Snoqualmie Pass and in the story, you can see how like I'm imagining Javerny, Monet's garden, and then these darker, denser fir trees start edging out that view. Um, and, and Bastille Day really commemorates the revolution, the revolution, the start of the revolution, where the revolutionaries destroyed the Bastille prison in Paris, which was essentially France rebelling against herself. So as this uh, Washington state um, landscape was sort of edging out France, it was it kind of felt like I was rebelling against myself. Um, then I went through Ellensburg, a place where I spent a lot of time at the rodeo and the rodeo party with friends. And um, Ellensburg shoved the Eiffel Tower aside a few inches. And I'm just going to read a little, little scene uh, later in the story. Palouse is rooted in the French word palouse, land with short and thick grass. And on this busty day, the fields had transformed into amber swells that swished, a fruitful crop awaiting harvest. Clouds puffed out their cheeks like the drawing of a wind in a child's storybook. The sky widened, sunbeams descended, dust devils spun in the distance. Cows posed in profile as if for a portrait. Shadows skittered across dunes that seemed to roll in undulating rhythm as if the earth underneath slowly stirred the waves of grain. My edges shifted outward a fraction. I pulled them in. My colors deepened, but I resisted, for I had become attached to my reverse culture shock. That is so descriptive. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I could just, I feel like I'm in the car. <laughs> it's such a, it's just such a lovely drive. And it did. It just, it basically edged out France. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to say too, I enjoy your, um, I have enjoyed during this interview, your, uh, your French accent and uh, formulation of the words. So, um, it, Bastille sounds so much nicer than my Southern Cal <laughs> California interpretation of Bastille Day. <laughs> well, it's a learning process. That's all I have to say. <laughs> yes. Um, what's the one place on earth that you would pick as the most mysterious for a movie or a novel? Well, I would have to say Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. It's so vast. It's just like, like I would actually say any graveyard anywhere because for me, uh, whether I'm in a small town in Idaho or in a little village in Ireland or in Stephen's Dome Crypt in Vienna, um, I sense the lives of these dead people. So, but Père Lachaise has you know, these gorgeous statues and these small chapels, which are these beautiful uh, little structures. And you, <laughs> to me, it, it's a very, very, very loud place because I can hear the voices of all these spirits. So um, there actually is a scene in my novel um, about World War II resistance in Paris uh, that's set in Père Lachaise. Wow, I just got chills just right when you were saying that. <laughs> I'm going to be looking for that one for sure. Um, and I encourage all of our listeners to look at your very interesting website, e-byrne.com. I was really intrigued with your quote on your website about the photos. The decisive moment is stirring. The photo takes me not the other way around. And you're quoting, oh my gosh, I don't want to say this name with my Southern California accent, <laughs> Henri Cartier-Bresson. Perfect. Yay. Good job. <laughs> Do you think this is also what we readers and viewers are asking of stories, that the story and takes me, not the other way around? 
Well, you know, on, on Ricard Tiebreson, there are two stories about him in the Wings book. Uh, he just keeps popping up in my life. And when he had this, this approach to his photography that was entirely intuitive. And so he, they called him, uh, they said he was like a dragonfly roaming the streets of Paris. And he, he felt like he clicked at this decisive moment, which basically means it's the moment his intuition told him to click. So I operate in all my work, my teaching and everything on this concept that if you go deep enough, you reach the universal emotion. And the only way to get there is by following your intuition. And so basically um, in in my writing, like it, Henri Cartier-Bresson had a lot to say to me about my intuition. He has a lot to say to you. Uh, Cezanne offers insights in my book into my childhood. He all he also offers you insights into yours. Winged Victory called up my authentic self. What does she call up in you? Uh, Montmartre is an area of Paris that really held up a mirror to me. Uh, we did three short films of stories from wings uh roger and i which are on my website and if you watch the one about Mamart, it's it's based on the story the mirror of Mamart. um it's kind of jungian but you know like if you go to Mamart or learn about Mamart, it will have a different thing to teach you so so yeah i i do think that that all stories point to something all good stories point to something universal whether they are um Journalism, travel, fiction, anything, or, or even spoken stories. I'm getting ready to go to this uh, long-form narrative conference in Berkeley, which is which is journalism. And it's the same thing there. I mean, we're all working toward that same universal emotion, all of us. Beautiful. Well, this, I mean, this has been so interesting hearing your answers to these questions and um, I want to ask Julie now, Julie, what about like, do you have summer vacations or summer travels that you do? I do. I do. And speaking of stories, I have a, a short one I wanted to share with our listeners, a personal story, one I think that speaks to the power of books and certainly the immersive magic of an evocative setting, settings like the ones that Aaron's just mentioned. Um, and this takes me back to what I call the summer I went nowhere. It, it was more than just a summer of discontent. It was kind of the perfect storm of awfulness, health problems, high pressure job, emotional pain, family issues, and on top of that all, financial worries. So we all needed a break, but we knew at the beginning of the summer that we weren't going anywhere for a vacation again. And I tried really hard to sell it to myself as a staycation. You know, those kinds of summers where you go nowhere and you work on things that need fixing around the house. And that's just as much fun as it sounds. Well, at some point, I decided that if I couldn't go to Italy or France or Spain, I'd work my way through those countries by book. And so I started by exploring Venice with Donna Leone's series with Inspector Guido Brunetti, tracking killers amidst the aging splendor of the Grand Canal. And then I moved on to a short jaunt to Paris with Kara Black's gutsy couture-loving detective, Amy Leduc. And I followed this trip up with one to Rome, observing police detective Aurelio Zen, created by the late, great Michael Dibden, as he navigates the twisty levels of corruption and violence in modern Italian society. I then took a brief excursion south to Naples with a memoir by Dan Hofstadter called Falling Palace, it's the story of an elusive love and an amazing ancient city, a place I first visited when I was 16. And then I decided to play tourist, stopping in Tuscany with Frances Mays in her book Bella Tuscany, which is truly a poetic tribute to a land, its people, and its wonderful food. From there, I traveled back to post-1945 Barcelona, to the Cemetery of Forgotten Books, using The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafon as my tour guide. And it's a superbly entertaining love letter to literature, one I highly recommend. In fact, it's a book Stephen King called One Gorgeous Read. 
My summer, well, it was not the one I expected, but we made the best of it, and it turned out far better than I imagined. I gained insights into places, cultures, languages, and people thanks to the gift of reading and the magic of extraordinary places which take you far away when you most need an escape. And I know we have some book reviews and recommendations coming up. Well, yeah, I think I'm going to jump right on that because uh, as far as wanting to travel and see exotic places, I, I agree that's a great alternative to read about them or I'm going to actually switch to recommendation on movie media. Um, so I've read the books as well by Ian Fleming, but I love the incredible scenes in the James Bond movies. And that is really uh, one of the reasons that I really just go to see those movies. I noticed that thriller movies do settings really well. And for me, that's the big lure to go and see those movies because thrillers aren't really my favorite. Um, but I just love the visual scenes and now the cinematography is done so well that it makes me feel like I've actually visited places that I've never been to. What do you think, Erin? You're so well-traveled. What, what's your recommendation for a uh, mystery that's got great dis descriptive landscape locales? Well, you know, I... I love, I, I'm going to just go back for a second to what Julie said about this immersive magic of an evocative setting. I love the way you said that. And, and um, you know, like, that's why we do this. That's what we want to offer people is this setting that's evocative for them and to actually offer them what you did over your summer vacation, right? To actually transport people to these places. But, um for a recommendation for a mystery, I, I I don't know if this is a classical mystery, but right now I'm reading The Enchantress of Florence by Salman Rushdie, and I think it's fair to say that um, he always goes straight for the mystery in his writing, meaning that when you're reading as a book, you, you first of all, you completely feel like you're on a quest, and second of all, he just evokes all these fascinating questions. So... This particular uh, book is evoking India, both India and Italy, in such rich like um, scenes and images that just completely transport. Um, it is about Nicolo Machiavelli, so it, it just weaves in all these really odd <laughs> happenings. And um, anyway, that that's one that I would recommend. That sounds great. And I've actually just finished something that is fairly offbeat, but it's a book by Colin Cotterell. It's part of a series called Slash and Burn, and it's published by Soho Crime. It's part of an ongoing series where he started with a book called The Coroner's Lunch, but you literally can drop in anywhere and still enjoy the read. And this particular series features a geriatric coroner, Dr. Siri Paiboon, and it's set in a place that I've never been and honestly never really wondered about until I got involved with these books. It's the country of Laos, and it's starting in 1968, as you might have guessed, sort of right during the edge and the end of the Vietnam War. Dr. Siri never wanted to be Laos's national coroner. In fact, he's the struggling country's only coroner. And now, approaching age 80, he hopes to spend more time with his wife before the untimely death, his, predicted by the local transvestite fortune teller. He is summoned by the Lao government, an offer he can't refuse, to lead an excavation for the remains of a U.S. fighter pilot who disappeared 10 years earlier in the remote Laotian jungle. The search party includes high-level politicians, a judge, a U.S. senator, American and Laotian soldiers, and scientists. When one member of the U.S. entourage is found dead, Dr. Siri knows it's not an accident. Can he get to the bottom of the mystery before the body count rises and the fortune teller's prediction comes true? Oh yes, he can, and in surprising ways. There's tremendous dry humor throughout this entire series, wonderful characters, 
and truly insightful views written by someone who lives in Southeast Asia on what it means to survive in a communist country after a devastating war. There's also a touch of the supernatural involving a 1,000-year-old shaman, but I don't want to spoil it for you. Just read it and enjoy it. And I think that just about wraps us up for today. Erin, I want to thank you for joining us as our special guest and helping us see the possibilities in these wonderful and evocative locations, whether it's right next door or in the Palouse in Washington State or across the world in some place fascinating like Morocco. Thanks again. We really uh, appreciate thank it. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure.